Hello everyone. Um, my name is Manal Asnash. I'm a pediatric intensivist. I'm originally from Yemen. I lived a good part of my life and practice and education in Saudi Arabia. I'm grateful for that and I'm currently based in the United Kingdom at the Evelina London Children's Hospital. Thank you to all the speakers. Uh, to Ifix has been a wonderful, amazing morning so far. I'm going to be one of the moderators for the panel. I'll keep my eye on the chat box. I'll ask my colleagues, Firas and Miguel, to introduce themselves first. So, uh, Firas, do you want to go ahead? Yes, hello. Good afternoon from Middle East. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity to participate on the European First for uh, PICU Awareness Week. Uh, my name is Firas Abudeya. I'm, the, I'm a clinical pediatric ICU nurse, also a clinical manager for PICU at Sheikh Reef Medical City uh, in Abu Dhabi. I'm being privileged also to be certified for uh, quality and safety uh, nurse, additional to my administrative roles. Uh, I'm happy also to participate and contribute with the questions to, to the presentation. It was really fantastic and new knowledge for me. So we'll take, we'll take it ahead and talk to our uh, presentative later on. Thank you so much. Miguel? Hi, everyone. My name is Miguel Rodriguez Rubio. I'm a pediatric intensivist in, in La Paz Hospital in Madrid, Spain. And I'm also the um, pediatric critical care medicine social media editor. And it's a pleasure for me to take part in this in this Q&A. Manol, if you, if you wish to continue. Perfect. Thank you. So um, we've got a couple of questions lined up. Um, there is a question from the audience um, that came in quite early during the talks and it's addressed to uh, Walid. Um, I want to first say Eid Mubarak to everybody um, and for the people who are spending Eid with us, an extra thank you, including uh, Dr. Walid, of course, um, and Firmas. Um, there's a question from Abdurrahman Shaya, uh, and he's saying, how do you see opportunities for interprofessional collaborative research in the Middle East? Okay, it's a, it's a question that requires another lecture to answer, but I can share my, um, uh, my perspectives. As uh, with any other uh, research collaboration, um, uh, similarly, you need uh, people who are interested, aligned um, goals and targets, and um, um, availability of infrastructure. Uh, but what I can say is the opportunities is absolutely available. Uh, there is no doubt in my mind that um, the Middle East in the next few years uh, will be a huge contributor to, um, to the research output. Um, so in terms of uh, collaboration locally, it all depends on the research groups and um, you know, their ability to connect and communicate and build infrastructure, but also um, having um, you know, well-established researchers from the world as we discussed in the lecture, you know, investing the time and, and resources and investing in people and trying to build connections. It's a win-win situation for everybody. Uh, what I like to see is what the uh, recovery trial investigators have done, an amazing job coordinating, um, you know, a huge number of centers and conducting clinical trials, including large number of patients answering questions efficiently it would be nice to see this done on a, a much more global level, you know, more coordinated. And I think professional societies and research group may play an, an important role in making this um, happen. Thank you very much. Firas, I think there was questions for Joe and um, uh, Pam, uh, for uh, Joe and Pauline, if you want to go ahead with that. Thank you so much. Yes, please. Um, I will first question to Pauline, if you don't mind. Um, Pauline, please share lessons and learn from your personal journey in international collaboration research. Uh, if there is a case we can utilize it, especially in the Middle East area, where we can promote more personal journeys in international research. Thank you. 
And thank you for this uh, question. Um, I'm a starting researcher, um, but uh, I'm um, especially research in uh, CRT. Um, so um, we have a small collaboration uh, with our, our PQ, uh, with a nephrologist, uh, and I'm the leader, uh, nursing leader of the uh, CRT uh, because we do a lot of education uh, as nurses. Uh, as part of the staff uh, and our nurses and um, so I do a lot of uh, research uh, with my network with Akash Deep uh, from the nephrology session of uh, ASPNIC and um, for my nursing uh, questions like um, the nursing workload uh, I work with uh, our other hospitals uh, in the Netherlands uh, and um, now, yeah, hopefully uh, in the ethnic uh, we get uh, a larger network and I think uh, it is a great opportunity uh, to step in in a mentorship program uh, like we started at ESPNIC um, because it is an, a formal educational tool uh, for professional development and uh, they support your career and job satisfaction for less experienced colleagues uh, from all backgrounds and disciplines and it aims to create a valuable network, increase knowledge sharing, and improve uh, interpersonal and communication skills. And I think it's uh, it's a great opportunity for nurses, uh, um, yeah, to um, making a valuable network. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to proceed with the second question, if you don't mind, Manal. Um, I have a question for Mr. Joseph, if you don't mind. Um, uh, looking at the research of opportunities for nurses in the future and having um, the ocean study one a good example to look after. Um, what advices you could give for a new researcher from nursing perspective? Uh, I can see it's a lot can be done, but as a new journey to start with nursing, how we can advise it to start with? Thank you so much. Okay, so I think um, advice is for anybody that's starting out on a research career or, or a career that involves some research is trying to surround yourself with individuals that are expert on that journey or on that career pathway. And I think for me, um, as a nurse scientist and as um, a clinical academic here in the UK, I've had tremendous support from professors that align to my profession but also sit with sit outside it um, and so I think it's it's about trying to find those people that will help support you advocate for you um, are influencers and enablers because they're going to help um, carry you and lift you on your journey um, and give you the guidance and mentorship that you need for anybody that's starting out on a on a research career. I think it's really important um, if we're doing collaborative research that we are can, can stand firm in, in, in our methodological expertise and understanding. So it's about having some research training and some robust research training, um, irrespective of what professional group you align to, you need to understand how to develop the science. And I think, you know, doctoral training is a really um, important part of that, that process and, and skill acquisition and, and development. And then I think, you know, the world is our oyster. What the pandemic has shown us whilst it's caused um, a lot of chaos and complexity, it's shown it's broken down conventional geographical um, boundaries. And I think, you know, be confident and reach out um, because we are a global community of paediatric critical care professionals. Um, there's clear alignment between our research priorities and our clinical commitments. And, and we're doing research not for the sake of doing research, but to have impact on the outcomes and lives of our patients and families. So I think, you know, be confident and, and reach out um, because that's the starting point for any sort of collaborative um, work. That's what yeah, another question, Mr. Joseph, if you don't mind, because maybe it can help me with your consultation. Thank you so much for your time, first of all. Um, I'm in a location where the multicultural approach, it's one of the key where we can survive. And we learned a lot, as you mentioned, the COVID pandemic last year and this year. Now, conducting a research, it needs a commitment. It needs uh, sustainability of time and support from the team and leadership. My challenge is to have 
a multicultural understand where we have sustainability for long term to have a good outcome out of the research. So which keys or which advices we can provide you to start with? Especially we are in a situation, we have to give more priority time for pandemic situation. Thank you so much. Yeah, and no, I, I don't think that's unique to the Middle East. I think we're all having to navigate some of the complexities that the um, global pandemic is causing. And, uh, and the reframing of priorities um, and we've experienced that here in the UK where a number of studies have been um, paused um, because of the focus and, and the redeployment of research delivery staff to other areas whether that's direct patient care or to other priority studies so I think you know the, these are commonalities that we're all facing and contending with but I think um, the ways that we we can overcome that is is through having a dialogue with those key influencers that are around us, whether that's the unit manager, whether it's the senior management within the hospital, whether it's the funders, you know, it, whatever is, is a potential barrier to enabling us to undertake research, then we need to think about how we can overcome that. And I think having a, an understanding of what those barriers are and then thinking um, creatively as to how we can overcome them is, is the way forward. And a, a lot of, you know, this is a priority area. Um, the pandemic has really shone a spotlight on um, critical care research globally, which is an absolutely fantastic position to be in for us as, as scientists. Um, so we need to mobilize on, on this and on this uh, position that we're in and think about how we can develop the science to align with service delivery priorities and clinical priorities, not just for now, but also to the future. And I think that really starts off with a honest, open discussion with all of those key stakeholders so that we're clear about what the potential barriers are and how we can start to overcome them. Thank you so much for your time. Back again to you, Michael. Thank you very much, Feraz. Miguel, there are some questions in the chat if you want to have a look at them. In the meanwhile, I'm going to ask um, Mark if you can please um, shed some highlight in terms of funding. Can small grants from societies like PIX, for example, pump prime a larger grant for a study and how that works? Sure. So um, I think anything that, so, so, I think there's a myth about research that it's some um, entirely an intellectual pursuit. It is largely a practical pursuit about getting organised and managing a project. And so if you can demonstrate something that has started and finished in somewhere near um, what you said you were going to do, and it, if there's secondarily a useful scientific output, that is reassuring for a grant awarding body. Depending on the setting in which you do that, the act of getting a peer reviewed grant in some settings and certainly in the UK itself brings extra resources. OK, um, and so there are so there's, a, there's the primary impact of getting that grant and delivering it. But there's also a sort of um, a route into support services, at least in the UK, through um, uh, clinical research networks. Um, I won't bore everybody with that structure, but but so yes, do it definitely. Small grants are, are absolutely the way to start. Um, they establish you as an independent. Um, they fill your CV, and you never know you might find out something of scientific value. Um, and a quick follow up on that, Mark, please. With um, sort of um, setups like the NHRR, um, fund somebody international. So um, the answer is is yes but reluctantly they are established to improve the care for nhs patients in the uk um, but there are scenarios and Waleed will be familiar with this where um, the question cannot be answered in a um, suitable time frame in just the uk um, so for example um, levon toom and i have a grant in at the moment um, for assessing for the value of assessing gastric residual volume um, and that's um, a collaborative grant with the ANZICS group, but it's going to go to the HTA. And so there are there are models. It's complex, and every different pair of um, international sites is uh, has its own details. Um, so yes, but always, Miguel, uh, over to you. Okay, so there's a question in the chat uh, from an anonymous attendee that asks, what advice would you give to pediatric critical care trainees or newly qualified intensivists with minimal research experience or epidemiology training on how they can break into 
sorry, <clears throat> into research more significantly as they try to move forwards in their medical careers. And I would like to link this to my first question to Professor Tasker, which is, um, what would you say to a um, trainee or, or a novice in research that gets their first paper rejected, let's say in, in PCCM, what would, what would your advice be for, for them? Tough questions, uh, thank you. Um, what is happening around the world uh, in many countries that are being organized into graduate education for sub-specialization within pediatric critical care is that it also includes a research period. Uh, sadly, uh, the UK system um, that I was brought up in changed where there was an expectation that uh, every um, graduate subspecialist trainee would have to do research of some sort if they wanted to get involved at a attending or consultant level. That's all changed and uh, there are right reasons and wrong reasons for it. Uh, the US model is to include a, a and, and I also believe Canada is to include a period of research within your or during your three-year um, uh, fellowship uh, that focuses on uh, either basic science, clinical science, or uh, masters of public health, something like that. So it, it really depends on, on what system you're practicing in. Some people have the advantage of being able to do a master's in public health or a PhD before even going into subspecializing in critical care and the other model of course is the MD PhD so do it even before you've decided what clinical sphere you're going into so there are lots of different models that have replaced the old model but some people just simply don't realize they're interested in research until they've started doing critical care and they think wow this is interesting I think I need to look into it so um, you know, it's a question of, are you prepared to take time out? Are you in a system where you can actually take time out and still get paid? You know, these are, these are all uh, sort of issues to consider. Um, your tif difficult question about rejection at PCCM. Uh, personally, yes, it is rejection if you want to use those blunt words. <laughs> Uh, the, the words that I choose to use is that it, it's a pathway, it's a learning experience. Um, you know, if it's your first paper, um, you know, what is the ratio of submission to acceptance? It's going to be accepted somewhere eventually. That's not like getting a grant. You might submit 10 applications and get zero accepted so you know it, it, it's it's a pathway that you choose if you want to go into research trying to get your first grant is much much harder than trying to get your first publication i think the 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 thing to do as mark has mentioned you know do your research but ch ch uh, choose who you do your research with pick successful people to mentor you into navigating that first publication. Uh, I think there are lots of other people who want to get in on this question because they're waving their hands. So I'll let them answer as well. Can I make a comment? Yeah, go ahead. Mark. So, so um, if you're going to be an academic, you are going to face failure more frequently than if you're not an academic. Um, it is um, it is part of the deal that you get your grants turned down, your papers turned down. And so if somebody comes to me and says, um, I'm interested in doing research, I'm really interested in how they, um, how stubborn they are and how reflective they are, how willing they are to take self-criticism. Because I think those are the two features that are, are um, I, I, Waleed may know what personalities are um, uh, closely correlated with success from his um, data, but I suspect they are. Um, and that's probably more important than scientific brilliance or um, insightfulness. It, it's a willing to, 
willingness to persist. So if I'm asked by a junior um, uh, about getting involved in research, there are lots of ways you could do it, many pathways. One of the ways that's now available that wasn't um, in Rob's day um, uh, is to be attached to some of the many multi-centre projects and see the complexity of the organisation and the, the, the degree of detail you need to fuss about, the wording of inclusion criteria, all that stuff that makes a project work. Start off by being exposed to that and perhaps do some mechanistic work alongside an existing trial structure. So you're leveraging something that's already in, in place. And I think that, that can be very powerful. Um, but being able to fail, um, be rejected, or go back and revise your hypothesis, however you want to word it, it's all part of the same thing, um, is a key um, characteristic for someone who's going to be a successful researcher. Great, thanks. There's another question from the, from the chat from Nilfer Osterk. This asking the panel, what do you think about the new sur survive and sepsis guidelines in general, strengths, weaknesses in particular with recommendations based on the geography? If anyone wants to go ahead. Maybe it, so um, I'm happy to start the answer or lead will have a, a, a comment. I mean, many of the panelists had a contribution to the surviving sepsis guide. So um, I obviously think they're brilliant with no conflict of interest as, a, as an author, but um, where there are weaknesses, my belief is it's a weakness in the evidence on which the guidelines are based. Um, and so if you're not comfortable with them, um, I would urge you to go and generate some data in your setting so that we can make them um, more nuanced, more accurate um, and improve further. We did a, a, a pretty thorough job of looking through what exists as, as data, um, but um, and, and the sad truth is it is incomplete. Um, so if there's any holes in it, I think we all share a collective responsibility for that. Um, is Walid going to say something or should I? Sure, go ahead, I'll go after you, go ahead. Okay. So I think from my perspective, uh, I was also involved, so I must dis disclose that. Um, from my perspective, uh, it it uh, was a product of the Society of Critical Care Medicine and Essicum uh, in this surviving sepsis campaign. It is what it is. It was the first iteration and it will undergo evolution. Uh, I think that it is inevitable that um, sec uh, sections around the world will find some of the aspects unfeasible. And uh, I think it's important that um, uh, critical care communities around the world look at this document closely and identify for themselves aspects that are simply not feasible for where they practice or are not relevant for where they practice. And either comment on that or, as Marcus said, um, develop one's own evidence. I don't think personally there is going to be any scope for 10 different versions of the surviving sepsis campaign um, document based on geography, but that's that's just my approach as an editor. But uh, I'll hand over to Walid. I second what you both have said, but I uh, also have a huge conflict of interest since I was the methodology lead. But I could say with um, uh, with comfort that comparing the um, work we've done with the Children Surviving Sepsis Campaign to other guidelines that I have led or participated in, I think the methodology and the, the scientific contribution from the panel was outstanding. And I would also urge people who find difficulty in applying those recommendation or understanding to pay special attention to the strength of the recommendation. So always people get confused when they hear the word recommendation. They mean you absolutely have to do it. Remember there are strong recommendations, there are weak recommendations. Go back to the document and, and look at the implications of each. And, and um, you know, I, I believe they are, most of them are, are, you know, clinically applicable and hopefully easy to understand. So, um, yeah, I, uh, I also think that this guideline have generated or highlighted the gaps in knowledge. And as my colleagues have mentioned, will st hopefully stimulate future work 
that is urgently needed in, in many areas. Back to you, Manel. I think probably it's time for us to wrap up. I think we are, we are approaching the one hour, 30 minute mark set up by WIFPICS for us. So I would like to thank all the speakers for their wonderful talks and all of you for such an engaging discussion. A special thanks to uh, you all three, Miguel, uh, Manal and Firas for moderating this session. And a very special thanks to WIFPIC for allowing Europe and Middle East to come together to collaborate. And I'm sure there'll be more collaborations in the future. And last but not the least, happy Eid to all of you who are celebrating both in Middle East, Europe and all over the world. Thank you all. <laughs>